our webinar today um, includes two speakers. Our first speaker is Mrs. Melanie Jangreco. Uh, Melanie is the National Program Assistant for Healthcare Without Harm US and Canada, Healthy Food in Healthcare Program. In uh, this capacity, she provides organizational support to the national program and uh, clinician champions in comprehensive antibiotic stewardship collaborative. Mrs. Jangreco earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Studies with concentrations in policy and design. She has more than 10 years of experience working on both conventional and organic farms, including small-scale meat processing operations. Our second speaker today is Dr. Johan benson Paul. Uh, you might remember from our uh, last webinar on antimicrobial resistance that uh, he's a researcher at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. He holds a PhD on the effects of antibiotics in the environment for uh, Professor uh, Joachim Larsen. The research of uh, Dr. Benson Palm covers the relative impacts of antibiotics from different sources, spanning investigation of aquatic environments, sewage and sewage treatment plants, as well as pharmaceutical production. In 2014, he and his colleagues presented an unprecedented uh, diversity of antibiotic resistant factors in an Indian lake subjected to dumping with pharmaceutical Many of these resistant factors seem to be easily transferable to human pathogens. Uh, there will be time following the two presentations for questions and answers. All participants will be automatically muted during this session. At any time during the webinar, if you encounter problems with your audio system or you have a question for a speaker, uh, please write it on the chat box at questions. So again, welcome to all of you and to our distinguished speakers. And uh, with that, I'd like to give the word to our first speaker, Mrs. Melanie Jangreco. Thank you, Adela. So as Adela mentioned, I work with Healthcare Without Harm US and Canada. And um, as was mentioned, Healthcare Without Harm works to transition the healthcare sector worldwide to become more sustainable. So in the context of food, Healthcare Without Harm's US-based Healthy Food and Healthcare Program works with hospitals to transition to food systems that are ecologically sound economically viable, and socially responsible. This includes how food is produced, processed, packaged, distributed, and consumed, and how any resulting waste is managed. We use the term environmental nutrition to define what constitutes healthy food. Whereas traditional nutrition focuses on biochemical components of food, for example, how many calories there are, how, many, uh, how much of a given vitamin or mineral is present in a certain type of food, as well as individual food consumption patterns, environmental nutrition has a broader scope. It accounts for social, political, economic, and environmental factors related to food system as a whole. And I've included a link to Healthcare Without Harm's environmental nutrition white paper on the last slide of this presentation. In an industrialized food system, one outcome is mass production of calories, which fits into a traditional nutrition framework. However, if we examine an industrialized food system using an environmental nutrition framework, we have to account for the food system's negative impacts on environmental and human health. One of these impacts is antimicrobial resistance. In the European Union, antimicrobial resistant infections result in 25,000 deaths per year and cost an estimated 1.5 billion euros in increased healthcare costs and loss of productivity. In the US, approximately 23,000 people die each year from antimicrobial resistant infections, and worldwide the death rate is estimated at approximately 700,000 people per year. Antimicrobial resistance is not a new concept. It was known that microbes could become resistant in laboratory settings as well as in the human body when penicillin was first made available. This is a quote from bacteriologist Alexander Fleming who discovered penicillin. In his Nobel Prize lecture in 1945, he said, 
It is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them, and the same thing has occasionally happened in the body. The time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there's the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug make them resistant. Bacteria are incredibly adaptive and resilient. When exposed to antimicrobials at low enough concentrations not to kill the bacteria, the bacteria develop resistance, which they then pass on to future generations. Bacteria can also share genetic information within species and across species, and they have a relatively short lifespan, so they reproduce rapidly, which also means that uh, resistance can occur rapidly. So how does this relate to food? The conditions at industrial scale meat producing operations are ideal environments for bacteria to develop resistance and to thrive. Animals are given low doses of antimicrobials in food and water, and through exposure to these low doses of antimicrobials, bacteria become resistant. Resistant bacteria can then be transferred to humans through improper handling or cooking of meat, through contamination of food crops that have been treated with fertilizers or water containing resistant bacteria, or through contact with animal feces at farms. Once people are exposed, resistant bacteria can then spread within human populations. In the United States, 80% of the antibiotics sold by weight are used in animal agriculture rather than to treat human infection. And as Adela mentioned in her introduction, um, many of these antimicrobials are given to healthy animals rather than ones that are sick. We have access to these data due to legislation known as the Animal Drug User Fee Act, which mandates data collection on the sale of antimicrobials used in animal agriculture. However, unlike in human medicine, this law does not require data collection and dissemination on dosage, species-specific data, or why the antibiotic was administered. And globally, there are very limited data on the exact quantity of antimicrobials used in animal agriculture. Having raised and processed a number of meat-producing animals, I can attest to the fact that routine non-therapeutic antimicrobials are not necessary to raise healthy animals. They only become necessary to compensate for crowded and unsanitary conditions that make disease outbreak more common. In addition to being a contributing factor to antimicrobial resistance, large-scale animal agriculture results in water pollution, soil degradation, and diminished air quality, all of which have consequences for human health. By focusing on reducing antimicrobials in animal agriculture, the result is a shift in a food production in food production methods as a whole to create a food system that is restorative to human and environmental health. On a global level, antimicrobial resistance, including the contributing role of animal agriculture, is gaining more attention from world leaders. In 2015, the World Health Organization released its Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance. In September of 2016, the United Nations held a high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance. The result of that meeting was a reaffirmation of the World Health Organization's action plan as part of a draft political declaration in which heads of state and government representatives agreed to develop national and regional action plans on antimicrobial resistance. Animal agriculture was recognized as one piece of a larger strategy for dealing with antimicrobial resistance on a national and global scale, as you can see from this quote from the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization. AMR is a problem not just in our hospitals, but on our farms and in our food too. Agriculture must shoulder its share of responsibility, both by using antimicrobials more responsibly and by cutting down on the need to use them through good farm hygiene. The Healthy Food and Healthcare Program advocates for the concept of less meat, better meat, which fits within the environmental nutrition framework that I described earlier. In the U.S., average meat consumption is well above recommended daily allowances, and this overconsumption of meat is a contributing factor in diet-related disease as well as environmental degradation. By shifting the scale-appropriate meat production, the benefits are human health outcomes through decreased meat consumption, better environmental outcomes through agricultural practices that can actually help to restore soil health, environmental health as a whole, and cost savings for hospitals since meat is the highest cost item on menus. 
Generally, when people think of antimicrobial stewardship, they think of it in the context of clinical care. The Healthy Food and Healthcare Program has expanded the definition of antimicrobial stewardship to incorporate all of the ways that hospitals can help to reduce overall antimicrobial use. This includes antimicrobials that are used to raise food-producing animals that are produced for, or that are purchased for patient meals and hospital cafeterias. To work toward the ultimate goal of better stewardship, we use market-based strategies and policy-based strategies together in order to be as effective as possible. In the U.S., market-based strategies can often yield results faster than policy-based strategies given how much power industry has here. Policy moves slowly and often follows industry, so by combining these strategies, uh, we're able to be more successful. As approximately 18% of our economy, the healthcare sector has a huge amount of influence in shifting the marketplace by creating demand for local and sustainable products, including meat raised without routine non-therapeutic antibiotics. When combined with other sectors that buy on an institutional level, such as schools, the aggregated demand is even larger. Once a large enough percentage of the market starts demanding a certain product, then the market as a whole will shift to meet that demand. There are a few main challenges that U.S. hospitals face in working together to create aggregated demand. One is the perception that purchasing meat raised without routine antibiotics will be cost prohibitive. Food buyers are often working with tight budgets. However, some of the hospitals in our network have figured out ways to actually save money using the less meat, better meat approach. They have been more creative with their menus by reducing meat, which as the highest budget item also reduces cost. Many U.S. hospitals subscribe to group purchasing organization contracts or outsource their food service to food service management companies, and this limits how much control they have over the food items that are purchased. If a hospital is under contract with a group purchasing organization that does not supply meats raised without routine antibiotics, it is more difficult for that hospital to purchase these items. Another challenge is sourcing a sufficient quantity of meat to satisfy the needs of larger hospitals and health systems. This is why aggregated demand is important. Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food and Healthcare Program works with hospitals to aggregate their demand for meats raised without routine antibiotics, thereby sending a clear message to suppliers. And that is exactly what is happening in the U.S. Hospitals are joining together to put more unified demand to suppliers. For example, Healthcare Without Harm, along with U.S.-based Practice Green Health, co-convenes a network of 14 large hospital systems representing more than 300 hospitals in a market transformation group. The collective purchasing power of these hospitals is estimated at approximately 195 million euros annually for food and beverages, with approximately 38 million euros of that being found meat and poultry. In August of 2016, nine of these healthcare systems released a joint statement demanding an increased supply of meat raised without routine antibiotics. This sent an important signal to the food marketplace that there needs to be a shift in production and availability of these meats. In addition to large-scale buying, hospitals also have the opportunity to create more demand locally and regionally in their own communities for foods that are raised in ways that promote public health. Policy change is the other main strategy that Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food and Healthcare Program uses to further antimicrobial stewardship. We co-founded a joint committee with the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society and the Sharing Antimicrobial Reports for Pediatric Stewardship Group called the Clinician Champions in Comprehensive Antibiotic Stewardship, or CAUSE Collaborative. The CAUSE Collaborative aims to increase knowledge within the clinical community of the link between antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use in agriculture and to promote policy action that supports judicious use. As Cause Collaborative member Dr. Saul Heim says, the ultimate root of the issue is overconsumption of meat, high demand, and an industrialized agriculture approach that leads to overuse and mismanagement of resources, including antibiotics. Clinicians and healthcare facilities should have a more consistent voice in institutional policy, procurement by institutions, and public policy on the part of local, state, and even federal government regarding antibiotic stewardship. 
Despite some of the barriers to creating policies that address comprehensive antimicrobial stewardship, there have been successes. In October of 2015, California became the first state in the United States to prohibit the routine use of medically important antibiotics in animal agriculture. This set a precedent that other states can use when proposing similar legislation. In January of this year, the United States Food and Drug Administration announced that it completed the implementation of guidance for industry number 213, which would transition medically important antimicrobials that are used in the feed or drinking water of food producing animals to veterinary oversight and eliminate the use of these products in animals grown in animal for growth promotion purposes. However, this industry guidance did not address disease prevention, duration of use, or guidelines for when intervention is needed. A coalition of groups submitted a petition to ask that the Food and Drug Administration withdraw approval for medically important antimicrobials in livestock and poultry for disease prevention, as well as growth promotion. Clinicians in the Cause Collaborative commented on the petition in order to add the well-respected clinician point of view to the fall debate. Cause members also mobilized each year as part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Get Smart About Antibiotics Week, calling their peers to action to encourage their facilities to commit to phasing out the purchase of meat raised without routine antibiotics. There are a few these are a few images from a social media campaign uh, from last year's Get Smart Week where clinicians shared stories of their experiences treating patients with antibiotic resistant infections and what their hospitals were doing to include animal agriculture in their stewardship programs. This slide shows a toolkit that's actually being released today, um, one of the most recent projects of the Cause Collaborative. This is the Antimicrobial Stewardship Through Food Animal Agriculture Toolkit Module. And this toolkit was developed to help hospital staff incorporate antimicrobial stewardship and animal agriculture into part of a comprehensive antimicrobial stewardship plan. Clinicians lead hospital clinical stewardship programs in the hospital setting, but this toolkit provides guidance on expanding existing programs to include stewardship and animal agriculture through purchasing and policy as well. While this toolkit is designed with U.S. hospitals in mind, there are sections that will be valuable to facilities around the world. And I've included a link to the toolkit as well as other useful background information on antimicrobial stewardship and animal agriculture in the next slide that will be sent out after the webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll we move to the scientific view and I give the word to Dr. Johan benson Paul. Thank you, Adela. So I have, and I have titled this um, presentation, Antibiotic Resistance is in the Air, but what does that mean? And this alludes to a study that we published last year, and I will come back to exactly what, we, um, what this um, title implies. But we're going to talk about airborne resistance transmission here, essentially. Uh, so, uh, before I move on, I should also say that I am at the Center of the Ant of Antibiotic Resistance Research in uh, Gothenburg, in Sweden. So, um, we all know, or most of us know, that we have seen a dramatic increase in antibiotic resistance over the last couple of years. Uh, in this particular slide, we're looking at the uh, proportion of uh, pro-requirement resistance, E. coli, isolated as European hos uh, hospitals in the <clears throat> last decade, approximately. Uh, and as you can see, we have seen a very large increase. This increase is mostly due to uh, misuse and overuse of antibiotics in clinics and with patients, but it might, another driving factor behind this resistance might also be um, per different practices in animal husbandry. What is also considered to be an important part in this resistance puzzle uh, is the environment. And the role of the environment has three different forms. The first is that the environment can function as a way for resistant bacteria to be transferred 
from humans to humans uh, via, for example, sewage treatment plants and fresh water, uh, but also via uh, soil and, uh, and, and food. And this might also fu function as a transmission route of resistant bacteria from animals to humans uh, through, for example, the food supply chain or through direct contact. Furthermore, the environment might also resist uh, the proportion of resistant bacteria if there is an antibiotic present somewhere. And this happens, for example, in environments subject to pollution with, um, uh, pharma with pharmaceuticals, but it might also happen in sewage treatment plants and in agricultural soils where, uh, where the antibiotic residues are known to be present, but at lower levels. Uh, this might also drive the influx of new resistance genes to the disease-causing bacteria, and these disease-causing bacteria might then uh, spread to humans either directly from the environment or through animals. Now, many things in this um, many things in this role of the of the role in the environment is not that crystal clear. We wanted to. Get, uh, we wanted to better un understand the environment's role in, in, resist develop in resistance development. And last year we published a study where we tried to better understand this um, through large-scale analysis of public data. So our hypothesis here is that environments where you have a lot of resistance genes, both in terms of abundance, but also in terms of diversity, that is the number of different types, those environments are likely to enrich for resistant bacteria and aid their tra transmission to humans in the long run. And I should say here that the uh, abbreviation ARG means antibiotic resistance gene. However, we essentially lack this kind of large-scale data of how resistance genes is distributed across different environments. So what we did here is that we took public data from 864 different samples that passed our uh, quality criteria. And most of this data was sampled by other research groups and then deposited in uh, public uh, databases. We, and, within, and the total data set comprised about 40% samples from humans, 17% samples from animals and 43% samples from external environments. And in humans, we had samples from skin, airways, uh, the oral compartment, human feces. And when it comes to the external environments, we, for example, got samples from uh, sediments, water samples, soil, sewage sludge, uh, pharmaceutically polluted environments, and also from air. Now, there was a particular finding in this study that generated quite a lot of international press attention, uh, and that was the presence of antibiotic resistance in, in quite high levels in uh, Beijing smog, which was the air samples that we looked at. So, uh, for example, there was, uh, and this was highlighted in the South China Morning Post, in Time Health, and also in the New York Times. Now, before I go into what, what we think about this finding, I just want to briefly mention what the methodology was here. And we have used a technique here called metagenomics. And in this technique, we, um, the samples are taken from vir virtually any kind of environment. In the case of the Beijing air sound samples, we, the, the, the samples were actually taken using air filters. So, Lots of air was filtered through, a fil was drawn through a filter, and then whatever was collected on the filter was extracted uh, in the next step. Uh, and the DNA was extracted from the samples and sequenced using modern high throughput platforms. Then this data was deposited in public databases, and this is the uh, data that we have been working with in this study. So what did we find? First of all, we found that in environments that had been subjected to pharmaceutical pollution, uh, we find very high abundances of antibiotic resistance genes. So that was the place where the clearest, clearest highest levels per bacterium of resistance genes were. And, this, um, uh, and in this respect, the Beijing smog samples were approximately on the same level as human feces. However, 
when we looked at the number of different types of resistance genes, the air samples stood out because they had the clear, clear they clearly had the highest, um, the highest diversity of genes, that is, the most number of types compared to the other samples. Furthermore, uh, the resistance gene composition, if you look at the number of uh, the different types of resistance genes that were in the different types of samples, the air samples also stood out as pretty unique. As you can see in this picture, um, the air samples are the light blue ones. Uh, and they were, but they were at the same time quite similar. At the same time, quite similar to each other. So it seems like this air, uh, the, the content of resistance in, is in air is actually quite special. What was also interesting is that when we looked at the number of different types of bacteria present in the different environments, and uh, the diversity of bacteria was also larger in the uh, Beijing smog samples than in all the other studied environments. Finally, we also compared this data to some, uh, some other samples where, which didn't pass our initial quality criteria, but uh, because we found the finding of resistance genes in air interesting, we still wanted to see if we could see some tendency also in this lower quality data. And this essentially showed that the Beijing smoke samples were not unique among these samples. Uh, there were other air samples that also had high abundances and uh, high diversity of resistance genes. So what do we make of this? Uh, could we see an, is there could we say that there is an influence on our health from these findings? Well, potentially we could uh, we could think about that, or we know that air samples from uh, taken from, for example, wastewater treatment plants and animal slaughterhouses um, actually carry resistant bacteria that can be cultured. So we know that it could be spread through the air and it could be a live bacteria in there. However, uh, we, now the question in this case is whether the, um, the um, bacteria in city air could be a risk. And we essentially want to know, could this cause an airborne infection? Um, and we, we basically think that the reason that air contains so many different types of resistance genes and so many types of different bacteria is just the reflection of that it comes into contact with a lot of different environments and therefore uh, also accumulates a number a very diverse collection of bacteria. What we should know here though is that the air collected on this filter is taken from one, more than 1,500 1, cubic meters. So there's a lot of air that gets filtered through this one filter where you collect bacteria. And the infectious doses of bacteria are likely to be much, much higher than we actually have here. Also, we only sample DNA from these bacteria and this DNA might actually come from bacteria that are dead. So we know very little about whether this, these, bacteria, these the resistance genes actually comes from disease-causing bacteria, and we also don't, don't know if these bacteria are alive, uh, and therefore we cannot really say anything about human health risks. What we do know, however, is that generally we don't get sick from breathing city air, so it doesn't seem to be a very big short-term health risk. And also, we, we know that other health problems related to smog are much more acute and probably much more important. For example, particulate matter, the levels of ozone, and ammonia. So, at this stage, we cannot really say that this data indicate any health risk whatsoever, uh, because we don't know the abundance of uh, the disease-causing bacteria, we don't know if they are resistant, and we don't know if they are actually alive and most likely it's not a big problem. That said, more research is, in, is needed into how air could function as a transmission for resistant bacteria, especially we don't know the sources of these resistant bacteria, and uh, we don't really know if this is a general feature of air or if this is something specific to uh, these smog events.
We also don't know if this is something that is specific to Beijing or China, or if it's something that occurs in every major city in the world. What we think, however, after looking at all these environments, is that there are certain things that um, constitute, a ri constitute risks for um, antibiotic resistance development. And those four things are essentially that if you have antibiotic selection, that would enrich for resistant bacteria. So if there's antibiotics present, that's one thing that makes an, uh, an environment a, a higher risk. If there's nutrients available, that also enhances the growth of bacteria so that if there is a um, competitive advantage for being resistant, they may actually exploit that. Thirdly, uh, it's an an another thing that increases the risk is if there's a close, close contact with humans. For example, if humans are um, in co close contact with animals, that means that animals is a little bit uh, more of a risk than uh, if, and then, then um, or farmed animals is a little bit more of a risk than uh, animals out in the wood. And finally, if there's a presence of human associated bacteria in a particular environment, that also increases the risk that this problem might at one point end up in a human, uh, in a human disease causing bacteria. So for air, None of the two first points really apply. There is no selection for, an, for antibiotic resistance because there's no antibiotics around in air. There is also very little nutrients available in air compared to many other places. And to some extent, there's a close contact, or in some places, there's a close contact to humans from air, but the volumes of air required here are to come up to the infectious dose are probably pretty vast. And finally, uh, to some extent, you can see a presence of human-associated bacteria in air, but still we don't think that this is a big problem in this particular um, in this particular place, unless you're actually very close to a sick person. So if we're, if we're looking at how we should prioritize these risks uh, according to these criteria, humans under treatments are probably the um, biggest risk environment for resistant dissemination and resistance development. Um, the second largest risks are likely farmed animals uh, because they are exposed to antibiotics, uh, often at sublethal concentrations, and also fish farms, um, since antibiotics are used quite extensively in, aqu in aquaculture in some parts of the world. Also, uh, all kinds of environments that are subjected to pollution with antibiotics are also at risk, particularly drug production facilities where we know that we have, uh, or downstream of drug production facilities, where we know that we have uh, high levels of antibiotics in some in instances, but also, for example, sewage treatment plants, landfills, and, for, and the different parts of the food supply chain, where you also see lower levels of antibiotics. However, in, that, in those cases, we don't really know if the concentrations are sufficiently high to select for resistance in bacteria. It's also important to point out that even though humans under treatment might be the biggest risk in terms of resistance development, interventions are much easier um, to, to uh, impose on, for example, animal farming and drug production, because in that case, we do not risk human li lives in the same way. While with, but while with withdrawing antibiotic therapy might actually risk human human health as well. So from from a, from a human health perspective, it's easier to have an intervention on uh, the animal side or the envir environmental side. And with that, I would like to thank the people who have co-authored co uh, the study that I was talking about, Professor Joachim Larsen uh, and, Ch and Dr. Chandan Pal here at the University of Gothenburg and. Dr. Eric Christiansen at the Chalmers University of Technology. And finally, we have received funding from uh, three different Swedish research funders. And thanks a lot for inviting me here. Thank you, Jochen, for your uh, presentation. Very interesting one, as always. Uh, we move on to our Q&A session. And uh, the first question is for Melanie. 
so the use of antibiotics in chicken is one of the problem in Nepal, one hour R&D said. Uh, many people are still unaware about antimicrobial resistance. Please suggest a method of advocacy at this level. I would definitely suggest looking at the Healthcare Without Harm website. Um, the group in Europe that Adela works with, so Healthcare Without Harm Europe, put out um, some really great resources recently. Uh, there's also information on the Healthcare Without Harm US and Canada website. Uh, and the group that I mentioned earlier, the Clinician Champions in Comprehensive Antibiotic Stewardship, um, does a lot of advocacy work. And there are a number of um, links to blogs that we've written about uh, antimicrobial resistance and uh, advocacy in hospital settings on the US, uh, Healthcare Without Harm US and Canada website. Thank you. And uh, another question also for Melanie. Uh, can you give us some examples of how hospitals have changed their menus to reduce the amount of meat served? Yeah, so one of the primary strategies that's been used to shift meals um, to less meat being served is basically using meat as a smaller part of the meal and incorporating more grains, legumes, and vegetables. Um, so, for example, rather than having an, an entire steak or a chicken breast as the main part of the meal, um, having that meat maybe cut into smaller pieces and used more as a garnish. And the Healthy, uh, Healthy Food and Healthcare Program is also piloting a project right now called the Blended Burger Project, where hospitals are testing recipes for incorporating mushrooms, beans, and grains with ground beef or other ground meat to increase fiber content and decrease uh, calories in the burgers while also lowering the food's carbon footprint. So those are a few examples. Thank you, Melanie. And now a question for Jochen. Uh, Jochen, how did it occur to you to study the air from Beijing? Actually, it didn't really occur to us to study the air from Beijing specifically. We were having this uh, large, we were having this large database of DNA sequences that we wanted to look at, and then we uh, we wanted to only look at high quality sequences, and we only wanted to do that look at data sets that were sufficiently large to actually say anything about the resistance uh, the resistance gene content. Uh, so, and we thought that it would be in, was interesting that we found these uh, about ten samples from Beijing Air, um, although. They were, of course, taken during a single smog event of four days, and it was a very limited data set. But we wanted to include it just because it was an interesting environment, but we had no clue that, it would, that we would actually find high, uh, high diversity resistance genes. We thought it would be really, really low. So it was a contra contrary to ex expectation. But the reason why we only have air from Beijing is that that was the only air samples that passed our quality criteria, and there's very little done, done on air in terms, of, um, in terms of looking at the bacterial content in it. And also for Jochen, since the research group of the University of Gothenburg has started to dig into this issue of the pharmaceutical pollution that leads to antimicrobial resistance, so back to 2007, have you seen any improvements in the situation at any level? It depends a little bit on on what you mean. Um, we have the first thing is that we you see improvement in the awareness of the problem. So there's there's many people who are are now discussing this as a part of the antibiotic resistance stewardship program, which I think is uh, that's a, a large step forward. Uh, however, um, if you if you Measure levels of antibiotics downstream of production in different places, you can still find really high uh, concentrations of antibiotics. So the problem hasn't gone away. Uh, what is now happening is that, for example, in the, uh, in the proposed Indian strategy uh, against antimicrobial resistance, they do, to my knowledge, as the first country in the world, they suggest to set emission levels for uh, antibiotics from production facilities. 
And I don't think that exists anywhere in the world at the moment. So if they would actually implement the uh, suggestions in that draft, uh, that will set a very high standard compared to the rest of the world, uh, much higher than what is, what is discussed currently in, uh, in Europe. And should we be afraid of the health risk of smog events? I think yes, but not for not because of antibiotic resistance. Uh, I think the um, the health risks when it comes to smog events is much more about the particulate matter and about uh, ozone, which are are known to in, in many major cities to uh, be above the levels that are deemed healthy uh, or that are deemed safe. Uh, so. But, but in terms of antibiotic resistance, I don't think there's any reason to be afraid at the moment. The, this is more of an interesting research problem or uh, that we would like to investigate further. To what extent would air be a transmission route for resistant bacteria? But here we actually think that it's more likely that uh, sewage treatment plants, for example, might be uh, a risk environment, much, much more so than regular city air, because there we simply think that the volumes of air that you would need to intake at once to actually pick up a resistant bacteria is too vast. Uh, thank you, Johan. Just uh, one last question. Uh, given your list of prioritized environments, what would be your top priorities in measures to prevent or delay resistance development? Well, yeah, as, as, as I touched upon here in my last slide, I think, of course, it's very important to um, uh, to try to reduce the use of the overuse and the misuse of antibiotics in human health care. Um, but a lot is already done there. Uh, we kind of give up, give up on that, but uh, I think the awareness now starts to be pretty high in the healthcare sector about this. Um, then after that, I think that it would be reasonably easy to restrict the use of antibiotics in animal farming. And it would also be reasonably easy to put, for example, emission levels on pharmaceutical pollution. So that would be top priority because I think that areas where we can come a long way with relatively small effort. Uh, when it comes to building out sewage treatment plants to have um, perfect treatment all over the world, that's going to take much, much longer time. Uh, thank you, Jochen. One last question for Melanie. Um, do you have any data available for Europe or uh, elsewhere globally regarding antimicrobial use in animal agriculture? Yes, yeah, so at this point, the data are very limited regarding antimicrobial use in animal agriculture. So in 2008, two years after the European Union banned all antibiotic growth promoters, the Surveillance of Veterinary Antimicrobial Consumption Project was launched. And many of you on this call are probably familiar with the European Surveillance of Antimicrobial Consumption Network. And the Veterinary Antimicrobial Consumption Project is essentially a same, similar data collection project, but focused on veterinary use of antimicrobials rather than use in human medicine. Um, and as different countries have phased out antimicrobial use for certain purposes over the years, some countries have collected more detailed and more comprehensive data than others. So the data are by no means comprehensive and outside of the European Union, um, in many cases, there's even less data available. And then, as I mentioned, in the U.S., we have very little data. We know, uh, due to the Animal Drug User Fee Act, that uh, the weight of antibiotics sold total amount, but we don't know what they're used for. So hopefully there will be more data in the future as people keep advocating for that to be made a priority. But at this point, there's, uh, the data are limited. I'd like to remind you now at the end that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Healthcare Without Harm Europe's website over the coming weeks.
For more information, please check Healthcare Without Harm's Europe latest brochure, Reducing Antimicrobial Resistance, How Health Professionals Can Help. I would like to thank the speakers for their great work and input today. I would also like to thank you all for choosing to join us. I look forward to continue the conversation on antimicrobial resistance in our future events. Don't forget to follow us on No Harm Europe, No Harm Asia, or NoHarmUSCanada.org. I wish you a nice day and goodbye, everyone.